Okay, so my name is uh, Daniel Bazin, and uh, I've been here at the NSCL for about 14 years. Um, so I'm now a, a senior physicist. So um, my role is uh, twofold. I mean, one is uh, supporting experiments which are run on various devices here at the lab, and um, my other, of course, is doing research. So in this, in this experiment uh, that is reported in that paper, uh, we uh, managed to produce and study uh, what we call N equals Z heavy nuclei, um, which are the three, uh, Kenyon 96, Indium 98, and Tin 100. And uh, Tin 100 is sort of a holy grail of uh, uh, nuclear physics because it's a doubly magic nucleus, which has the same number of neutron and protons, um, and it is located close to the drip line. So it is very interesting for, so for those reasons. So uh, what we call magic nuclei uh, in nuclear physics are nuclei which have uh, closed shells. So you know the, the nu nucleus uh, behaves a little bit like uh, the, uh, the atom, uh, where you have a certain number of shells. And uh, uh, if you want to go past this shell, you have to add extra energy. And so those uh, so-called magic numbers correspond to closed shells. And that's the uh, backbone of uh, nuclear structure theory. Okay, so <coughs> the fact that uh, TIN 100 is um, uh, very close to the drip line and still should have the properties of a magic nucleus is uh, very interesting because uh, from all the studies that we do on, on, uh, on radioactive um, isotopes shows that this shell structure actually uh, changes as you go away from stability. Okay. So here's an example of a uh, 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 nucleus which should be, you know, should follow those, those rules of the uh, stable nuclei, yet is very close to the drip line. And so that may not, you know, behave like in, uh, in isotopes which are um, in stability. Uh, so what's unique, uh, I guess, would be that uh, we, were we were able to produce and observe it for the first time in the United States. I mean, so far, uh, the observation of this uh, nucleus has been seven events, and which were all done at uh, GSI in Germany. Okay. And so there have been many attempts. I mean, th those experiments uh, started, I think, in 1994 or something like this, so a long time ago. And it is very challenging to produce uh, this nucleus. Uh, so that's the reason why so few events were uh, uh, obtained. And so in our experiments, thanks to the new device, uh, the RF uh, separator that we built, we were able to observe 14 events. So uh, the, the method that we use to uh, filter, uh, to produce and filter those, uh, those radioactive isotopes here is uh, by using project projectile fragmentation uh, from a stable beam, which is accelerated by a cyclotron. So in the case of the TIN-100, uh, we uh, uh, we have a very, very large number of contaminants which come with the TIN-100. And it's that number is so large that it actually prevents to take the full beam intensity, okay, because our detectors cannot handle the rate. So by building this uh, RF uh, separator, which was uh, financed as an MRI from the NSF, uh, we were able to uh, um, put additional filtering onto this beam so that we can extract uh, the TIN-100 and also, um, of course, some other nuclei of interest. Well, obviously, uh, with 14 events you know, of TIN-100, uh, we could only measure the half-life. And this is the very first uh, step in studying a nucleus that you can do uh, with so few events. Uh, the next step, of course, is to try to produce more. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we had limitations, even though we were able to, to perform this experiment, we still had limitations uh, on the beam intensity and also on some of the parameters of the experiment uh, that could definitely be improved. Um, actually, we were expecting to have more, uh, but that's, you know, that's just the nature, uh, how nature works. In this experiment, which was aimed uh, firstly at producing TIN-100, we also produced uh, another N equals Z isotope, which is Camion 96. Um, and this uh, isotope is very interesting, but for a different reason. Uh, this has to do with uh, astrophysics, actually. So there is, uh, you know, natural abundances of isotopes that are observed in the solar system, and uh, some of those abundances are still unexplained. And this is the case, for instance, for ruthenium-96, 
uh, which you know cannot be explained by regular slow processes that that uh, are used in, in regular astrophysics calculations. And so one of the processes would be uh, what is called the RP process, which runs along the, uh, the drip line, the, the line where uh, isotopes are uh, almost unstable. And so can Canyon 86 was uh, so far not measured. And so the half-life that we have measured uh, you know, has provided a very, a very valuable input for the astrophysics. Um, case of ruthenium-96. So our, our result shows that uh, the, the site uh, for which we people were thinking uh, could be an explanation of the abundance of ruthenium-96, which is X-ray bursts, uh, which happened in some kind of, you know, some kind of environment, a stellar environment. Uh, so our result shows that uh, this calculation, these particular conditions cannot explain the abundance, uh, the observed abundance of ruthenium-96. So therefore, you know that sh shows that there must be some other source which explains the uh, observed abundance of this uh, isotope. So yes, the, um, the um, not only the experiment but also the uh, building of the RF separator itself was done uh, with uh, the collaboration of many students, and so this is a, a very important part of, of our mission here is uh, to train them and give them some experience. Uh, not only doing experiments, but also building all the uh, tools which are needed for performing those experiments. As an experimentalist, um, what I'm really uh, curious about is to study nature. And uh, we know that in nature there are many unstable isotopes uh, which are not found naturally on Earth. And so the only way to produce them is uh, by using accelerators. But we know that those isotopes exist you know, that uh, particular number of protons and neutrons can be synthesized into a nucleus. And so this is, uh, I think, one of the biggest reasons to study those, those nuclei, because we want to understand how they behave, how the nuclear matter changes as we change those proportions. Okay, so that's, uh, that's one motivation. Uh, the, nuclear, the nucleus, sorry, uh, in itself, of course, is a very interesting object because it's a quantum, it's a many-body quantum object. And so to try to understand this object requires, you know, very complex theories and which uh, are still not to the point that we can really predict, uh, have a predictive power of how a nucleus will behave. Okay, so this is still a very open uh, field. And of course, there's other ramifications to this field that I was talking about many-body physics, and many-body uh, physics has many, many uh, ramifications in other fields, like atomic physics and so forth. And um, also in astrophysics, of course, we are tightly uh, uh, connected to people who do astrophysics because we know stars uh, use uh, nuclei to make the power. And all this nucleosynthesis, natural nucleosynthesis, uh, where we come from, basically. Uh, we want to understand that. So that's a big part of nuclear physics as well. And this is uh, um, a field of uh, physics which is doing you know, incremental uh, discoveries, I would say. Uh, no big discovery uh, and so forth. But I think it, it is um, um, very exciting because of, of all the ramification it has uh, to other fields, and as well as the uh, theoretical thinking, you know, which is behind uh, the study of the nucleus. NSCL is a world-leading laboratory for rare isotope research and nuclear science education. Operation of NSCL as a national user facility is supported by the Experimental Nuclear Physics Program of the National Science Foundation.